Hey guys, thank you for watching today's video. Today I'm doing a Q&A video. Some of my Instagram followers sent me questions over direct message and they were great questions, so I'm gonna try to answer about 20 of them today. I only have about an hour to film, so I'm gonna try to do this as efficiently as possible. Uh, this first one is from Sean and he asks, how does one improve speed of playing? Like, I can do slow passages easily, but fast ones are so hard. Let me see if I can do this in order, because there are quite a few of them. Um, I'll start with this one. So you put the metronome on, maybe to about 60, and you put your left hand finger down with the click, and then you move your bow with the next click. So bum, 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 bum. Bum. And you play what's written just like that, where you separate the two hands, but left hand goes first, and each of those motions happen right with the click. Whenever there's a lack of coordination, usually it's because the left hand is behind the bow. That's usually what makes fast passages so hard, right? Is because you're not coordinated enough, or you're having too much tension, which those things are definitely related. So I'll get to the tension aspect in a second. So you do the left, right, left, right. You can do that. And then this one, I think this one is one of my favorites, where you take a list of rhythmic patterns and you overlay them on top of these written passages. But you keep the bowings, obviously you keep the fingerings, you just throw the original rhythms out the window and you overlay yours on top of it. I think I have a full YouTube video on this. If I do, I'll link it in the description below. Let's say that you have you're looking at a sheet of music and you have a line of just running 16th notes and they're just all 16th notes all over the place. What you would do, and I have a sheet of rhythm options that I use, it's like um, two eighth notes with followed by four 16th notes. So you play that passage exactly as it's written but with this new rhythm. So bum bum ba 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 bum ba 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 bum. Then you could reverse that rhythm. Any kind of rhythm organization pattern that you can think of is probably going to help you. There are a lot of benefits from doing this exercise, but one of the main things is that having those um, distortions, they basically highlight little areas or little string crossings or shifts that are causing you problems that you wouldn't catch unless you applied that crazy rhythm on top of it. So let's say that you're doing ba 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 bum and you have a shift between those two last 16th notes, if you hadn't been playing it like with that rhythm, maybe that's not the best example, but um, if you had that shift and you hadn't been applying that rhythm on top of it, then maybe you wouldn't have like felt, oh, huh, that shift is actually really hard and maybe I'm not in control of that shift. So it's highlighting all of these different issues that you might not realize that you had before. You can go through, circle those things, really hone in on those parts, fix those up, and then, you know, put them back into context and the passage should go better. So to help with coordination, left hand preparation and then overlaying different rhythmic patterns on top of the passage. Now to help with um, tension, again, there are so many exercises that you could do, but the one that helps me quickly is just marcato. So, ba, ba, ba. Because with marcato, what you do with your bow hand is you bite, you bite into the string with your bow, but it's an immediate relaxation. So bite, relax. So there's an, an action and then an immediate reaction to that. So your bow hand, that's having that relaxation built into every single movement that you're doing, every single little thing. You're, you're practicing relaxation. And if you play a difficult section using that marcato technique, what happens is that our hands mirror each other. And so your left hand is gonna very likely do what your right hand is doing. So if your right hand is automatically relaxing, guess what your left hand is gonna do? It's gonna start to relax too. So you're gonna have that initial necessary bite to really you know, get the string to, to do what it needs to do, but then immediately the finger relaxes the tension and so you get this really clean, relaxed playing and you do that slowly and then gradually speed it up faster and faster until you get it where it needs to be. Um, and then just a broad blanket statement answer to this question is just 
practice it slowly so slowly to where it's about to drive you mad my dad would say the fastest way to learn a piece is to practice it as slowly as possible it works it really does you just have to make yourself practice slowly and then one day you wake up you're like oh you know what i can actually do this i can play this pretty quickly and then you can start raising the tempo pushing it a little bit each day don't overdo it and then at the end of your practice session if each of those days like back it up a little bit and the next day push it farther back it up push it farther it's kind of like you're stretching a rubber band to see how far you can get it without snapping it wow that was a really long answer to this question but um, I'm I'm really I guess passionate about that kind of thing of being able to achieve something that seems impossible but just by being patient and taking one step at a time and taking into account your body and your muscles um, and just being aware of these details it's like it's it's a really great feeling when you can just overcome and you can do something that you didn't think you could do before just through patience and dedication all right question number two this comes from Jason how does one go about overcoming discouragement at their lack of progress I'm in a funk right now because I feel like I should be better than I am I think one of the things that helped me through that is just to have first of all to have goals right you have to have goals um, but not to obsess over them and that's one of my things is like I get so infatuated with my vision of the future that I obsess and then I start to lose appreciation for where I am right now and how far I've come so yes you want to have your goals and that'll definitely keep you going keep you motivated but I think just taking the time to look back on what you've done and make a list of all the things you're proud of and all of the accomplishments that you have achieved you know start out each practice session by doing that there's nothing wrong with that I know I think it's kind of an old-fashioned concept where it's like you can never you can never compliment a student because then they'll feel like they won't need to work hard I don't agree with that I really don't I think that encouragement encouraging someone else or just encouraging yourself the more that you do that it actually motivates you to keep doing better it's positive reinforcement um, I'm not a psychologist so I don't know how all of that works but it makes sense to me it's like whenever I am building myself up looking at what I've already done and feeling proud of that then that gives me the confidence to just get up another day and go at it I mean it's a balance right because you you know that you always need to improve but yeah you gotta you gotta take into account what you've done and that's why I'm really big into documenting I write everything down what I've done that day and every single day I will write down what I thought was a highlight of that day like I got a compliment today from a pianist a mind-blowingly talented pianist who heard me play yesterday at a at a gig and it was it it like warmed my heart so I'm gonna be writing that down like she said I sounded beautiful I played beautifully I'm like I'm gonna remember that I'm gonna hold on to that yeah I don't know if that really answers that question thoroughly enough I have a lot of thoughts on it and I'm gonna keep thinking about it so maybe I'll make a whole a whole video just on that topic okay question number three hi from California beautiful Sarah Aw, thanks um, I have a question would you say you're the same person or a different person on YouTube as opposed to real life and why yes I unfortunately do think that I am a little bit different on YouTube I tend to get into teacher mode so it's not just me being a certain way on YouTube it's like me being a certain way whenever I'm teaching other people maybe there's even a difference between that I'm not really sure but I do get into teacher mode and of course online I do want to make sure that I'm being professional and uh, thoughtful about everything that I say and in my personal life I think I'm a little bit more careless which is not a good thing yeah I think that would be the main difference hopefully I'm becoming more comfortable though in front of the camera I feel like I am I feel like I've, I've opened up a lot so question number four if there were to be one concept for the mind body hands arms or what have you what technique would you describe as being a platform from which everything that is learned and can be made possible through practice and further evolved and that without such technique everything either collapses or is unsustainable in short what would you deem as the technical keystone to learning how to play an instrument I love I hope that this makes sense I love your music pretty sure every teacher's answer would be scales could be wrong about that I would say scales I mean they they teach you the finger patterns and the way that your hand shape 
evolves through a sequence of notes, and the pitches should make sense as you're playing them because it's a scale, right? You can't really mess that up too much with your ear if you can, if you have a sense of pitch, if you can hear pitch clearly, you should be able to play a scale without any problems. So because they're relatively easy, um, you can focus on a lot of different technical things, but taking each of those techniques one at a time, which when those are applied, scales become really, really difficult. So you play a scale once, but you only think about intonation while you're playing it, which, wow, if you practice your scales without vibrato, focusing on intonation, that is very enlightening, very enlightening. So you might try that. And then you practice the scale again, this time thinking only about bow straightness, for example. That's very tricky. You would need to practice that in front of a mirror. And the list goes on. There are so many different techniques that you can focus on, like, okay, keeping your left hand fingers curved or keeping your elbow low, keeping your shoulders relaxed, so many things. I think that's my best answer. Maybe there's something else, but that would be my, my go-to. Question number five, what percentage of the original classical pieces carries the original mood and feelings of the composer? Hmm, I mean, does the score really show us the original ideas to these great, of these great musicians? How does it work? Oh, man, that is a loaded question. Um, okay, so a score can't tell us everything. There's no way, and we don't know what a lot of these pieces sounded like whenever they were composed because they didn't have abilities to record them at that time. A lot of classical musicians nowadays can kind of trace their lineage back. My teacher went to Curtis and Juilliard, and so he studied with those cellists, those cellists studied with the cellists before them, so it's kind of like this heritage thing. And a lot of cellists can kind of trace back to maybe around those times, and so a lot of the traditions that I was taught come back, you know, from hundreds of years ago, and so I get those now. But it's like whenever you play the game of telephone, where things kind of get distorted along the way, I feel like that's what happens, right? Like someone teaches it this way, and then that person gets it, but it kind of morphs throughout their career, and then they spread it to another student, and that morphs, and so I don't think that there's any way that we can know for sure what that composer really wanted. I mean, they're I mean, this is why music his historians exist, right? Because they take into account context and they try to give us the best way. Well, I don't, I don't want to get into that because I am not, I'm not knowledgeable enough in that area to really get into it deep. But I would recommend a book. It's called The End of Early Music, and I'll try to remember to link that in the description below. It gets into a lot of that stuff. And I know that you were talking more about classical music, and this has more to do with Baroque music and before that as well. I think the concepts still apply, so I think that book would really answer a lot of your questions. Question number six. Hi Sarah, I have a three quarter size cello, my first one, and this winter the bridge has been slipping a lot, so much that I can't even play it anymore, let alone tune it. I'm not sure if it's simply the weather of the size of the cello, the shape of the bridge, if I need new strings, or if I simply just need to invest in a full size cello. It could very well be a combination of several, although as a violinist, I noticed that my violin bridge hasn't slipped nearly as often in the winter. Any advice, tips, or insight on what I can do? I'm, I'm really not knowledgeable in the area of like instruments. I just, I have mine, I love it, and I, I play music on it. I will say this, a three-quarter size cello um, should not do that just because it's a three-quarter size cello. This girl in college, she played cello on a three-quarter size because she was she was a small, a small girl. Um, and it sounded great and it didn't behave badly. I would take it to a string shop, have them look at it, and yeah, sorry, I can't be more help with that one. Question six. I would love to know how to develop your vibrato on cello. This is a skill that I would love to have but can't quite figure out. I have a whole vibrato series on my channel that should help you, um, but I'll try to do a brief summary um, in this video. Do not do this, where you're rotating your hand. Bad vibrato, very bad. You want to engage your whole forearm. There is no break here, and your elbow stays pretty much stationary, so you have this kind of motion. The easiest way to practice this, for me, I think, is just to go like this, make a regular you know, playing shape, put it on your shoulder, maybe have a wall that you can lean your elbow up against so it doesn't move, and then go up, forward, up, forward, up, forward. And then just simply transfer that to your fingerboard. There are a lot of other exercises, but 
um, you can check out my videos on that. And again, I'll try to link it, try to remember to link. Okay, um, question number eight. This is from Jordy. Uh, hey, what types of exercises should I use to get my voice in both the lower and higher ranges? I'm asking because I'm trying out for a jazz band singing thing. I'm not a, I'm not a vocalist. I sing, but I, I haven't had any real formal training like two lessons in my entire life though. I really don't know anything. Just be sure to relax whenever you're trying to stretch your range. Don't clench this. Make sure that everything is nice and relaxed in your jaw area and in your neck. And um, yeah, question number nine. How long have you been playing cello? How old am I? 20 years. I've been playing cello for 20 years. That's a long time, man. You're making me feel old. Question number 10, what inspired you to start singing with your cello? I just really like singing and playing at the same time. It's just fun. It's a really good challenge. It is so, so hard to do. And when someone says that something's hard to do, I'm like, let me try. I want to try that. Number 11, this person asked two questions. This is from Camille. And she asks, how long have you been singing versus playing cello? I've been singing for as long as I can remember. I, I don't know. Um, but again, cello, I've only been playing 20 years. What is your dream instrument to learn next? Mm. Well, I never settled myself down to really learn the piano, but man, I would love to become good at that instrument. I'm okay at it, but I could be so, so much better. It's just hard because, you know, playing one instrument alone takes, you know, <laughs> four to five hours of practice every day on top of running your own business basically and making videos and all of the other things so it's hard to find time to mess with another instrument next question um let's see what are your best tips for someone who would like to become better at playing the cello i've lost my motivation over the course of the last few months i need to find that spark again p.s i really admire your talent and dedication to your music yeah um for me if i'm having a hard time finding motivation it's like if i just start if i just sit down that day with my cello and play a scale everything else kind of follows after that a lot of the not wanting to practice feelings come from okay i don't know what to practice i'm afraid that i won't make any progress um those kind of thoughts and if you just have a routine so if you have a routine set you know what to start you know how to start you know what to practice and that way you're still you're gonna make progress even though it may not be a breakthrough day and you may not emotionally feel like you've taken a lot of steps forward it's only as you do something just do something that day and eventually it starts compounding and compounding and it'll get you through that funk you know you may have like a low period that lasts a good year but if you just are persistent you're gonna get through that you know everything everything passes nothing lasts forever so you're gonna get through that funk just push on through do your best be disciplined and don't <laughs> don't be influenced by your emotions I mean as artists we really like to listen to our emotions and you know but that's not a good way to live so just do what you got to do and um, having a teacher for sure really really helps because they can tell you that you've made progress even when you can't tell that you've done that yourself so they can give you feedback and really encourage you to keep moving forward. Okay, um, next question. Where are you from? Oh my gosh, you're, you are an amazing singer. That's so sweet, thank you. Um, okay, so I don't wanna give my exact location because I don't want to put that out on the internet, even though you could probably find it anyways, but I am in West Texas in a smaller town. I was born here, grew up here, moved whenever I went to university by myself and then from there I moved to Dallas and then I moved back home and it's interesting that this question was asked because I have been thinking quite a bit about this a lot of people ask me why I stay here in a small town because you know there aren't really that many opportunities for musicians here <laughs> not many at all you know maybe someday I will move but first of all my friends are here my family's here my church is here my whole community um, and that, that is very very important to me but this living here there aren't a lot of distractions so i can stay focused on work and the people here the whole culture here they are real they say what they mean and they're not afraid to say it and their lives are very admirable they work hard they take care of their family they're honest 
I'll just say that living here gives me a lot of inspiration for songs and creativity, and there's a lot to pull from. There's a lot of depth. There's a lot of depth in these small towns, and um, yeah. Okay, so next question. Um, been loving all the sneak peeks and the demo version on YouTube. Do you know where there's lyrics for your new song, Land of the Ceiling? Um, I want to try learning it on the piano, and I'm known for hearing lyrics incorrectly, so I don't want to get it wrong. Um, yes, so for those of you who don't know, um, this person is referring to my new playlist called The Adenium Project. And The Adenium Project is basically where I'm going back through the last two or three years of Instagram posts, where I would post these um, song samples like little snippets of things that I would just create on a daily basis. I'm taking those and I'm um, expanding them into full songs and I'm going to be sharing the process on my YouTube channel of demo versions and then I'll share the final versions and um, painting videos to go along with it and maybe a couple of vlogs here and there. So my latest one, sorry, I'm having like allergy issues. So if I'm not speaking very well, that's why I'm like trying to, I'm just trying to hold it all in. <laughs> sorry. The most recent video, um, that I posted to that playlist was Land of the Ceiling and those lyrics should be in the video description. If they're not, I will go do that right after I finish editing this video. But for sure, at the end of this whole project, I'm planning on putting together a book of sheet music for it. So the lyrics will be in there as well with all of the notation that your heart could desire. Next question, is it too late to start learning the cello? Absolutely not. You can start learning the cello however old there may be different difficulties and you may have to be a little bit more patient or work harder um, than someone who started younger. It's definitely an advantage to start young, I'm not going to lie, but that doesn't mean that you can't do it. I have a student who is in his 50s and he is doing phenomenally, phenomenally, so no limit. Next question, um, this person would like to know what are some tips for the adult beginners? On cello. Time management is really tricky. So you have like a weekly goal list, write those out and then break each of those goals down into something that you can work on each day. Break it into these little things and practice really, really carefully. Don't just play through things because that doesn't do anything. You have to really, really break it down and play. Um, you have to break it down and work on the spots that are really giving you trouble. Also for adult beginners, you have to uh, you have to learn to be more forgiving with yourself in terms of sound production. Kids, whenever they make a bad sound, it's like, yeah, whatever, I love making noise, I love making bad sounds because it, it annoys my parents. But as adults, just like one bad sound and it's burn this instrument, I'll never learn to play it. Somehow learn how to get past that and realize, okay, I'm going to sound absolutely horrid for probably the first one to two years and then then I'll, I'll get into the groove of it. Another thing is tension. As adults, if you're bending over a computer all day, your body starts kind of forming these weird muscle things that can affect your playing. So you have to be very aware of what you're doing with your body and be aware so that you don't hurt yourself. And doing yoga is a great way to kind of deal with that. It gets rid of the tension from the day and it prepares your body to just, okay, here's where we need to be. So that would be my best answer for that one. And the last question. Oh, did I already answer that? Sorry, that was so anticlimactic. Um, but I am basically out of time anyway, so I'm going to end this thing and get to my next event of the day. Thank you all for watching. I really hope that this video answered the questions well. And if you have any additional questions, please put that in the comment section below. I'm sure I'll do another one of these videos at some point. Thank you for watching and keep an eye out for my next video. Bye.